Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to MTB Podcast, episode 93. I am Jeff. I'm Jared. And I'm Liam. This is the crew from Worldwide Cyclery, which is who Worldwide Cyclery is hosted and sponsored by. Wow. Circles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is a good drink. I have a really nice drink. Um, <laughs> this podcast, we're going to cover actually some really good stuff. I'm excited. It's just us three. We're going to go over uh, some trends in the mountain bike industry, a lot of things that we're seeing right now that are just interesting talking points regarding suspension designs, e-bikes, electronic suspension, universal derailleur hangers, slowed down innovation. I don't know, all sorts of stuff. Are you excited for that, Jerry? Super excited for all of it, yeah. But more importantly, we have piles and piles of good Ooh. listener questions that range from... Wow, from Every, everything from what facial hair is faster, uh, what rotor size you should be running, and uh, where to store your water while riding and how much you need. I mean, and there's drilling like, holes in your aluminum uh, frame, oh, right? And yeah. drilling holes in your aluminum frame, yeah. Drilling holes is a really good topic. And whether you should or not. Yeah, we've done some sketchy modifications on bikes before, so we'll get into that a little bit later. As well as Kushcore, tire inserts. I don't yeah. know, there's a whole bunch of good mountain bike-related questions here to Tons. educate your mountain bike brain. Woo! All right, DJ Green Goblin, who no longer has green hair, please play a sound effect. DJ Green Goblin with no more green hair. All right, first question. Are we ready? I don't know, Jeff. You don't look ready. Well, all right, you look ready now. What are we going over questions, or you want to go over some quick personal updates? Oh yeah, no, we should do that first. I was just so excited for this question that I really wanted you to answer it. But yeah, I'm jumping the gun. So yeah, Jeff, what's you know, what's new? Tell us. Well, what's what's new for me? So a couple about two months ago, right? I thought it would be a funny idea to put on the Worldwide Cyclery and the Kettle Mountain website a shipping option for a thousand dollars that was hand delivery by Jeff. And I think most people didn't think it was serious. Actually, I think probably half of our staff thought it was a joke or didn't really understand why I was there. But I was I told people, I was like, no, I'm just honestly, I thought it'd be a funny idea. It's, I, we made it so it's only the lower 48, just a continental United States. And I was like, I will, I'll just hand deliver the package if someone actually buys that. And I've done it twice so far. So we actually, uh, when I was out east recently visiting our shop in Pennsylvania, we hand delivered a bike, McCluskey and I, the other guy who uh, runs a shop there. We drove down to Annapolis, Maryland. It's an awesome guy. We built up a custom build for him, delivered the bike in person. He owns a restaurant. We had, we had food. It was amazing. It was a great time. And then the day after, I got on a plane and flew to Rochester, New York to deliver a box full of drivetrains and brakes and, and other mountain bike parts. <laughs> and that one I was thinking, you know, it was like, what what should we do? And Jared and I were on the phone for, I don't know, maybe an hour trying to brainstorm, I don't know, just funny ideas of how we could create content. Because we were going, I was going to Rochester in March. It was supposed to snow. It was 40 degrees. I was like, oh, I can't really ride bikes. I was like, I wanted to make a whole ordeal out of this when it happened. Um, but then Jared had this brilliant idea of hiring a local mariachi band. It just came into your head? Yeah, it did. <laughs> <laughs> and when you said that, I was I was instantly skeptical. I was like, there's not Rochester, New York, mariachi band. No way. <laughs> sure enough, just go into Google, hire a mariachi band in Rochester, New York. <laughs> Nailed it. And, and uh, there was some sort of gig musician website. I put out a thing. This was two days prior to the hand delivery, and I actually found the only – Mariachi band in Rochester, the next nearest one was in New York City, which was three or five hours away or something. Yeah. And um, yeah, hired the mariachi band, and and it worked out perfectly. I was, you know, I was I emailed the customer, I was texting him, and I, I said, hey, here's here's the deal. Uh, don't look out your windows and don't go outside until I say until I knock on the door. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I've never really texted anyone. That's kind of weird. <laughs> Not shady at all. Not shady at yeah. all. But I was like, just just don't look out your windows. Yeah. And uh, sure enough, I, I showed up and mariachi band was there. We got got all set up, and they actually brought me an extra sombrero, and you know, I knocked on the door. And they started playing their music. So they actually suggested a song. I forgot the name of the song. It's like a celebratory mariachi song. It was good. They suggested the song and knocked on the door. Guy opens the door and, you know, here I am with a sombrero on and a mariachi band just blaring the songs. <laughs> <laughs> and a box full of awesome bike parts. And a box full of bike parts that, that I literally did carry myself all the way there and, you know, checked the luggage on the plane and everything. So it Sounds was a like lot the more. the best day ever, honestly. It was pretty fun. It was a lot more work than I had thought. Um, it was a pretty big <laughs> box. It was a four, There was a fork in there and a bunch of other stuff. So it was actually pretty cumbersome to carry that carry that onto the, I took the train that day and then to the airport. And it was, <laughs> it made me think like, wow, these, you know, FedEx and UPS, these guys are that's a lot of work to deliver these boxes. Yeah. They're also why they get over it and smash our bike parts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. 
But yeah, it's been pretty fun. So I don't know. That's that's a couple little things that I've been up to that are uh, interesting. And and the shipping option's still on the website. It's at this point I I'm considering if I need to up the price or if I just I just run it for a little bit longer. Now that it's summertime, I'll be a lot more happy to go pretty much anywhere in the continental U.S. in the summertime ish. Yeah. yeah. You gonna throw one up for Jared for five hundred dollars? Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of funny comments. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people want that option. I think you should add that, and you should also make an international option. Yeah, there was um, a lot of that, comments there about is both demand. of those. There's demand yeah, there for demand. not only me, but, but also Liam to come. Oh, yeah, I think someone stuff. said, well, two grand get Liam here to work on my bike or something. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, everybody pay I mean, more for Liam to charge it a discount. <laughs> 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 it's hilarious. A lot of, there's a lot of theories on this. But the more I thought, man, if this was international, we'd have to be – I mean – this is a big world. I could end up who knows where to yeah. yeah. parts. Kathmandu. I mean, I mean, sheesh. it could cost a, f- a yeah. metric fortune. To and get then some <laughs> that with COVID restrictions, yeah, be pretty. Uh, it would be wild. Be a yeah. challenging one. We'll see. I'm just glad things like this are happening again. It's good fun. Yeah. Shipping options still there for anyone that wants to spend a thousand dollars to have me hand deliver something. It's actually not a joke if you yeah. see it when you're checking out. So that's that, Liam. What do you got going? New hardtail. Uh, Ooh. yeah. Finally got a hardtail. I think I've dreamed about it on the podcast before wow um so we got a hardtail y cycles el jefe titanium hardtail um it's been pretty sweet we've got like i don't know 200 250 miles on it so far it's pretty much like i used to ride hardtails when i was racing xc but they weren't that fun because they had narrow bars and long stems and no dropper posts and the geo just wasn't nearly as good as it is now so now the spike rips um yeah, it's been fun to just like put in long rides on it. And uh, you know, do you know why hardtail riders are so adamant and serious about why hardtails are the best? No, I don't. That's a I, good question. I don't I, either. I don't actually think they're the best. Because I think they're super fun and simple and like I purposely made this one have like a mechanical dropper, mechanical drive chain just so it's kind of like, you know, naturally aspirated. Yeah, kind of just, you know, then you're Kind of just like you know, a straightforward bike. There's nothing too yeah. fancy about it, but it's just going to ride good and like for years. Yeah. Um, and I, I kind of – I I wanted a hardtail again because I was riding gravel bikes in spots that they weren't really supposed to be ridden like too often to where I was just like this is dumb because a hardtail like would do this way better. Yeah. So that's kind of why I built it because I was just tired of like – Smashing square bump single track on a gravel bike. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds yeah. Yeah. Hardtail is good for that kind of stuff. Yeah. And a lot of people also email and, you know, chat in saying, I want to hear more about hardtails. So you have answered their prayers. Yeah. I have a pretty racy build on it. It's pretty, like, I'd say definitely more on the XC side. How much did that bike turn out weighing? Uh, anyway. Right now with the rw27 the revel wheels on it it weighs about one just over 24 pounds with pedals oh wow, wow. and you have a sid just sid, a regular sid, sid ultimate on. uh 120 sid, mil sid ultimate yeah oh okay so that's the one with the 35 mil stanchions. yeah right? it came straight from my ranger right on that bike um i've got g2 ultimates with 180 rotors um 2.4 tires dropper post um so it's it's meant to handle some like actual riding uh, if I wanted to, I could put on some weight weenie wheels and get it down like 23 flat. Nice. Which I think is pretty solid for a titanium hardtail. Yeah. Definitely. It um, does seem nice and light. Yeah. That's cool. Nice and light. So, uh, Jared, turns out you have a bum hoof. Bum hoof, yeah, man. Oh, man, you bummed your hoof. <laughs> Not rad, dude. <laughs> That's actually a pretty funny story. So yeah. uh, you were you were sitting in the shop with your foot up on your desk. Yeah. Like, this The whole last two weeks, every time I've walked out, I've yeah. been just with your foot elevated on your desk. Yeah. But some guy came in and said, yeah. oh, you bummed your hoof. Bummed your hoof, <laughs> man. Customer that lives probably next to the beach came in and yeah. he's like oh uh, dude you bummed your hoof I did. <laughs> and it was awesome and i was <sighs> cracking up and i don't think we talked like, about sure that did. on the podcast last time but no. last podcast we recorded with adam the founder of rebel bikes we were riding with him yeah you were actually riding his bike i was riding his you, bike you crashed it which is like a huge part of the reason why i crashed, you crashed it hard and bummed <laughs> your hoof but yeah well right in front of him right and, in front and of him. two other guys and two were, other guys who were watching us ride the sketchy yeah. part of we're the like, oh check it out dude i'll show you how to ride it that's how you do it right there you, you technically your didn't crash right you just washed yeah, the front wash the front stuff the stuff your foot stuff my foot yeah like didn't even touch dirt yeah it's just like was bracing my fall basically and braced it at the worst place there's a huge rut on the inside of the turn and i just landed my foot right in there you mean your hoof 
My hoof, your that's hoof. right. Yeah, and then my, your my hoof, hoof was all purple and green for. Is it still purple oh, and green? It's actually not anymore. Uh, it's still a little it's, swollen, but it's looking pretty purple and green there for about yeah. a week. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's it's a lot better. I didn't now. know if you're for real, for real or not. If I'm being honest, until like <laughs> a day or two later, and it was yeah. like actually purple and blue. I'm like, Blown oh yeah, up. you really bummed your hoof. Man. Yeah, yeah, it was bad, but yeah, it was. It's a lot better. I mean, I went for my first like decent ride since I heard it today in Sycamore. Um, hour and a half, eighteen miles on the gravel bike, so that was cool. Mm-hmm. Um, then yeah, did a are you able to ride. get out of the saddle, or are you just kind of staying a little bit? Yeah. But yeah, pretty much trying to stay in the saddle. I mean, like yeah, um, yeah, just not trying to push it. But yeah. yeah, that's pretty much it. Did a little road ride with my dad and uh, Solvang over the weekend. We went up there and did some wine tasting and beer drinking as well. So it was nice to ride up there, and just kind of you know ease into it. Did he get his new e bike? He did, but he, uh, he hasn't ridden it yet on trail. Mm. No, just like it's just so funny to watch him ride around and he's just like smiling and he's like this is ridiculous <laughs> and i'm like i know it's it's crazy the it's transition fun. repeater yeah. yeah repeater could you the repeat repeater. that can you repeat that please that's pretty cool yeah he loves it it's rad i'm, nice. I'm gonna try and ride it when he's out of town <laughs> <laughs> like the other bikes yeah, that you yours. bought <laughs> yeah yeah but you know Jared and his bike purchases for his family that are actually sort of for him. <laughs> hey, you know, just not the oh, first, not the last. Out of town this yeah. weekend? Sweet. Yeah. Let me take it out. <laughs> exactly. Nah, I can't wait to ride it. I think it's sweet. But yeah, that's pretty much all I got going on. Yeah. Very just cool. Stoked to get back on that bike in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. I haven't had an injury in a while. Except yeah. you said your back hurt. Other morning. than my back. I got a, I got the back of an old man, but. Uh, the that's just the that's man. just part of living a life of and doing extreme sports as a kid and BMX and s- skating and motocross and all that and scorpioning myself. <laughs> you that, should give it back to him. That was good, dude. Thanks. <laughs> give it back to him. <laughs> yeah, I said you're the back. Oh, man. What I need is a backy out of me. I gotta get a backy out of me. Gotta get a backy out of me. All right, right, let's go over some of these trends in the mountain bike industry. I just wanted to chat about a few of these because they're always interesting. And I figure, you know, we have tons of listeners that love the mountain bike industry and want to know what's happening trend wise right now. And it's, it's kind of been, I'll start out with the the fact that it's been a bit slow. I mean, I, I feel as if trends used to happen and they would kind of, they would show up sooner and they would be more talked about and all these new stuff would be coming out and it would have to do with X, Y, or Z. And, but I don't know, there's there's a lot less sort of innovation right now and a lot less, I think, effort being put into R&D in the last couple of years because, um, you know, the pandemic obviously caused a lot of turmoil in the bike industry. So people are just putting less effort into R&D and more effort into, hey, we just need to get product and get it on time and solve all these other million problems rather than worrying about introducing new products constantly since that's getting just harder in this day and age. Um which is kind of a bummer. So it's, yeah. I don't know. I think the main trend is that there's less new stuff all the time. We used mm-hmm. to see new stuff all the time. I mean, every, it was like every every other month, Yeah, you know, especially during It was almost too much. Season. Yeah, it was almost too much. It was just like always new products and new bikes coming out. Um, it new slowed, standards. It slowed down a lot. Quote, unquote, standards. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I don't, I'm hoping that that'll pick up again. I mean, it obviously keeps the bike industry interesting and has for the last probably 20 years. There's just kind of constant innovation and constant new products, which are rad. So hopefully that'll kick back up once supply chain stuff gets in a little bit better shape. But some things that are still trending, uh, a lot of new bikes that are coming out, almost all of them, I think, have the UDH, SRAM's Universal Drailer Hanger, which from what I understand, SRAM designed and pretty much just said, hey, this is open source. Everyone should use this. Yeah. Drailer Hanger works great. Everyone just use this because... Every, most everyone knows there's a million different derailleur hangers. It's comical how confusing that is to buy. So SRAM's trying to solve that problem by just telling everyone, hey, use this design. So I don't know. Yeah. Who's not doing it? I mean, I don't know exactly who isn't doing it. Yeah, it think. seems like most brands, even big brands, Trek, Specialized. Um, Santa Cruz. I feel like Santa maybe, yeah. Cruz on some of their bikes, I think. Uh-huh. Um, some of them, they do use that sliding dropout for the chain stay length, so it doesn't work with that. But, yeah. Um, like on the chameleon. And- but I feel like, yeah, I feel like if you're not doing anything funky with, like, chain stay lengths, then why would you not spec a UDH that right. you don't have to design, you don't have to manufacture, you don't have to manufacture extras, like you just it's buy them from SRAM, like yeah. you're buying, you know, chains for your OEM bikes. Yeah. Yeah, and the idea is that, you know, every rider on a modern mountain bike with a universal derailleur hanger can go into essentially any bike shop in the world and they'll have a derailleur hanger yeah. in stock. Yeah. And it's about it's half cool. the price of what? Yeah, they're, yeah, they're not expensive 25 at all. 25 or 28 bucks or something, bucks or something yeah. like that? Where like other derailleur hangers are like 40 to 50. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I just don't know why it took us so long to get to this point where we were like, oh, we should maybe make these yeah, universal, like, yeah. idiots. <laughs> How about, like, the first time we made a mountain bike, we were like, oh, we should just make this thing standard for all of them. Well, oh. there, there, <laughs> I get your point, but there has been now a bit of a settling in terms of hubs to some extent mm. and, and hub standards. Whereas before you had QR axles with 135 and then you had 142 and then 148. Yeah. And now there is some stupid boost stuff going on. But, um, but all so the through axles closer. could use the same. Yeah, UDH. exactly. Which, which is why you see UDH yeah. on super boost or just regular yeah. boost. Mm-hmm. So and it's, it's getting there. It's got some good designs too, where like it not only is it meant to break like every other hanger, but it also, I believe, will swing a certain way. If you hit your derailleur, it'll actually swing up out of the way. So it, some derailleur hangers, if they get hit so hard, they'll actually crush into your frame mm. where the SRAM UDH will swing in a different way that also won't damage your frame. So nice. yeah. it's I good like design. That. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. So that's a good trend to see new bikes being released in the last five years that are all coming with the UDH. So Yeah. I'd that's probably say last two or three it's really caught on. That's true. Yeah. yeah. That's that's when it's like, oh wow, this everyone's gonna do this. Yeah. This is good. This is really good. Um I guess another thing we had on here was uh suspension, electronic suspension. So Fox Live Valve, that was kind of the first electronic suspension, I think that was like yeah, really at least. talked about and big, and then RockShock released their flight attendant not too long ago. This and is a trend also, that's yeah. not taking on so much right now, right? Yeah, I think for a couple of reasons too. It's one, it's expensive. Yeah. Outrageously expensive. Yeah. And it's only available on certain bikes. Yep. Yeah, it has to be spec OEM for Fox Live Valve or RockShox Flight Attendant. Live Valve, your bike actually actually has to be like wired for it, kind of how like original DI2 bikes were back in the day, with like Shimano DI2 road bikes. Oh, mm-hmm. God. They need a mount for it. <laughs> um, Flight Attendant is, uses uh, SRAM and RockShox access wireless systems, so just to access battery and it's wireless. So. Mm-hmm. That makes it a little easier on the manufacturers, but you still need to spec it OEM. Yeah. So I think like the Enduro was something like a thirteen thousand R bike or something like that that came with it. Yeah. So huge price. I mean, also negligible benefits. Yeah. I mean, if you read a lot of the, I haven't ridden it yet. We've had a couple guys on our team that have ridden them, um, and just some of the reviews, and like no one. I don't know. No, no one is raving that this is revolutionary. It's like, oh, there's some cool yeah. things here and there. I just, I don't know. I, I don't think anyone is really pushing hard of how incredible it is, cause yeah. it's, which kind of tells you it's maybe not that. I guess we should also say, too, that this is a electronic lockout for your suspension. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's the whole point of it is to basically read the terrain as with, you know, um, what do you call them, like, all the accelerometers, different, accelerometers yeah, just and different sensors and data stuff. inputs from its sensors. Read the terrain to out, and yeah. either have your bike unlocked or locked based on the terrain. The difference is Fox Live Valve is kind of geared more towards the XC side where it kind of seems to be always locked, and then it opens up as you're hitting rough terrain or jumps and drops. RockShox Flight Attendant is kind of geared more towards longer travel enduro bikes, and it kind of seems like it stays open until you need it to be firm to climb. So there's there's two totally different ways that these companies are going after it too. So yeah. it's not like they're both tackling the same problem. Yeah, it's just really early. I mean, I, I think there's some merit to the idea, but until they really dial it in really very well yeah. and the cost comes down, yeah. it could be a while before you see that. Yeah. And Available just the compatibility more and yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, making it universal. Yeah, I mean, I do see, you know, the application on a long travel enduro bike that maybe doesn't pedal that great. Like, you know, off the showroom floor, the bike probably like doesn't pedal great or it has a bunch of bob or something like that. Right. Maybe flight attendant would be good in that scenario, but like yeah. for a bike that pedals pretty well, it's yeah. just like, why, why? The other nice thing about flight attendant is you can actually, it does have its own um, algorithm and sensors, but you can actually override it. Right. And toggle it for your needs. So, right. It could be useful. I think some of the specialized enduro EWS guys were running it, and it makes sense because they can firm it up a little bit for a 20-second sprint and then open it back up and go smash them downhill trails. Yeah. But that's a very sp- specific use. I don't think any of us need to go no. stiffen up our suspension for a 20-second sprint. Yeah. Yeah. Like a second. yeah, exactly. Good point. 
And if I did, I'd probably just reach down and flip the switch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, it's tough to imagine how much this is. Yeah. We'll, we'll see. I don't know, I'm obviously on yeah. the side of thinking that bikes are kind of at an innovation plateau because they just work so amazing right now, as is. Good high-end mountain bike just works so good. It's hard. Mm-hmm. It's hard to imagine that anything's going to be revolutionary. There'll be tons of iterative stuff that will make small improvements, but over the years, but yeah, anything big revolution, things are going to be as important as a reliable dropper post. I mean, that was a big deal. Like, there's yeah. been a lot of innovations in the last 20 years, and I think it's it's hard to imagine there'll be ones as revolutionary in the you know preceding 20 years, but we'll see. Speaking of suspension stuff, so high pivot, mid pivot, the first downhill World Cup was just this week this yeah, last weekend last right? weekend mm-hmm. and there was a ton of bikes that were using i guess what could be considered a mid pivot so they're you know if you listen so we had nico malali one of the racers that we sponsor um in his whole program this year where he's designing his own bikes to race at world cups he was on the podcast and he really really dove into high pivot suspension design so if you're if you're curious on that topic or looking at a bike that is a high pivot there's there's certainly i don't think there's Yes, it's better. Or you, you know, no, it's worse. It, there's just it just is different, and depending on your riding style and terrain and all of that. And Nico did a really good job breaking that down because he's just so living in that world of suspension design, and it's just interesting to see he's, in my opinion, just really ahead of the curve on knowing and understanding this stuff, which is why he's doing things like designing his own bikes to race. But you have uh, all these different brands in the downhill World Cup that are trying to mess with this, and it seems like it. There is a lot of merit to high pivot and or mid pivot when the bikes are going really fast and have a lot of suspension travel and maybe a little bit less merit when it's just your average six inch travel or below trail slash enduro bike. It's just not as relevant there. So I don't know. We'll see. But I mean, there is still some pros to it in just an enduro bike with a high pivot for sure, depending on your riding style and what you're doing. So yeah, but I, that is a trend that's happening. I mean, people yeah, are talking about it and bikes are designed like that. And so kind of popping up. You know, last couple of years in enduro scene, right? Forbidden has one. Deviate, which we carry, has one. Yeah. Norco has two, I think, a mm-hmm. high pivot and a mid pivot. Um, and there's more coming. So, you know, they're making it. Maybe they're just making it because it's a niche and it has its, you know, benefits, but they're definitely out there and they're growing. So, yeah. yeah. It, like you said, it just kind of fits a certain rider and their style and, that's what the beautiful thing about bikes is, is they're a little bit something for everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, exactly. If, if, if you're really looking for that, that rear suspension to perform its absolute best with no limitations when you're riding the thing very fast over rough terrain, then it's a great design. It makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's some sacrifices there here and there and other uses of that bike. But yeah, it depends on what you're looking for. Yeah. I don't know. It's another one of those cool things where it's like, wow, we have so many choices as mountain yep. bikers. <laughs> seriously <laughs> which is good and bad uh, <laughs> yes i think one of the only other you know major trends that everyone's aware of is is e-bikes e-bikes and e-mountain bikes are just getting a lot more popular and growing and more people are riding e-bikes that used to hate e-bikes or used to think they would never ride one and it's just a really growing segment right now it's actually when you look at kind of the overall growth of the mountain bike industry in general it's it's uh let's let's exclude 2020 and 2021 because those are very abnormal years um, but mountain bike industry has not really grown in a sense, but e-bikes are growing like mm-hmm. crazy in all segments, especially in the high-end mountain bike scene. So that's an interesting trend to see not losing steam whatsoever. Yeah, so. it's only gaining mm-hmm. and like pretty fast. Totally. I think, yeah, you get people who are used to be not down and now they're down and, they're, and they want to ride them or they rode one and they're like, okay, now I get it. Yeah. You know, and then they're telling their friends and then they try them and then you have whole groups of people that are going to get e-bikes. Yep. Yeah. Just like that. And there's like some wildfire. network effect stuff too, right? Where, where one person gets one and it's really fun and then their one buddy gets one and another buddy and then now yep. there's like a, isn't that happening to you, Liam? You have like yeah, a, a group I'm, of friends that only ride e-bikes I'm now so you pretty only, much can't ride with them unless you're on one. Yeah. I mean, most of us do ride both like a shorter travel b- bike that, you know, normal bike. And then an e-bike, which is, you know, your 170, 170 travel kind of enduro bike. Um, so, yeah, I'm kind of – I'm getting edged out or should you say edged into the <laughs> e-bike world? Yeah. It's yeah. like, oh, if I want to ride with my buds, then I need an e-bike now, um, where otherwise maybe I would have never had an e-bike if that wasn't the case. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I went to a local riding zone 
couple of weeks ago, and I think I saw me and my buddy were on normal bikes. The rest of our crew are on e-bikes, and maybe saw two or three other normal bikes, and one of them actually had a rope attached to his buddy's oh, e-bike. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've actually seen that um, already. Yeah. <laughs> so and like and the rest of it was like twenty twenty five riders on e bikes. Yeah. And it's just insane because that zone two years ago only had one person on e bike and it was Troyden. Yeah, yeah. Who was like early, early adopter because he hates pedaling so much. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's quite an interesting trend. I'm definitely excited for Forestall. So Forestall is an Andorran e bike brand that we're actually gonna start carrying in when, Liam? <laughs> Hopefully eight to ten weeks. We should have some bikes. Okay, eight to ten weeks. Yeah, so it's, we have a couple test bikes right now which look incredible. And, uh, yeah, they've been developing those for a long time with Cedric Gracia and a bunch of other good riders. So, yeah, I'm excited. I mean, it's one of those things for us. Like, we're, we're a retailer, right? So we want to carry boutique high-end brands. And if there's demand for e-bikes, we're going to find a really premium e-bike brand that makes fantastic stuff. So I'm excited to see Forrest all kind of come to life and get some of those bikes in here as demos and yep. see what our customers Same. like and staff and everything. So those that'll be sweet. cool. Yeah, they look rad. So, yeah, if you're, if you're curious, Forrestal, F-O-R-E-S-T-A-L, just hit them on Instagram. They actually post some really cool stuff on Instagram. Yeah. So we'll show all the custom paint work they're doing. It's yeah, a sick. lot of behind-the-scenes stuff. And yeah. Yeah. It is cool. So e-bikes, they're not losing steam. Um, they're gaining lithium, though. They're gaining lithium. That's right. Burning lithium ions. Uh, well, before we hop into our listener questions, a quick word from our sponsor. Ooh. And now, a word from our sponsors. Hello, mountain bikers. Jeff again. Just wanted to quickly ask you all for a favor. I would genuinely appreciate it if you would check out Trail One Components. Trail One is a brand we are invested in and one I personally worked on crafting the founding team, which includes an obscenely overqualified engineer as well as the famed BKXC. The idea was to create premium mountain bike components that truly support the sport of mountain biking by giving back to trail networks with every single purchase. We have a growing line of products, which can be seen on the Worldwide Cycler website, as well as at trail1.bike. Speaking of which, if you use the code podcast on the Trail One website, you can snag $50 off your first order. Only 15 of those codes exist, so get after it. That's trail1.bike. Thanks. And now, back to the show. All right, Jeff. Please rate... This facial hair from fastest to slowest, mustaches, goatees, beards. Uh, as far as aerodynamics, I'm going to say mustache, then goatee, then beard. But what? Uh, but I don't know if we're just talking aerodynamics some, here. Some or we're just, just what, talking fast for the sake of being fast. Just makes you fast. Looks fast. Doesn't have to be like you know, like actually. Like, could you imagine a sick goatee with some really cool glasses? That guy's going fast in life. Liam, what do you think? Mm, mustaches and goatees are pretty neck and neck, I think. Mm. Beards are like the man's makeup. Like beards are just beards, you know? <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. this is a tough question. I've never heard that one. I think one, a good mustache is probably fastest. Yeah, I think he actually ranked them already. He in did. In order kinda, from right? fastest to slowest. Yeah, he should have thrown some more of a curveball. But, yeah, I think oh. it's mustaches, goatees, beards. I don't know if I've ever seen any mountain bike racer that was really fast that had a full-blown beard. Have hmm. you? I mean, that's like super not arrow. There, <laughs> there's, there's, <laughs> we're talking mountain bike There's, there's a couple there's road riders. Consideration. Uh, controversial one, Luca Paulini. He got caught doing some stuff, but he had a full blown beard. Okay. Well, was he fast because of the stuff he got caught doing, or because he had a beard? <laughs> Both. Well, I mean, we're ta- let's talk mountain bikers here. I don't know any fast mountain bikers with a full blown beard. Yeah. Mm. Jeff Kabush had some gnarly sideburns for a while. Yeah, that's true. Some chops. I thought I saw someone like, will, Max can Morgan somebody some chops. Can somebody some please solid facial hair? Yeah. Email. Yeah, but I'm like a like a beard. Yeah. Like see, a beard. Steve not, Pete's got a good goatee. That's true. Maybe maybe a mustache. I'm still talking about beards. <laughs> <laughs> can somebody please email podcast at worldwidecycler.com with the answer to what fast mountain bike racer had a full blown beard? Um some, yeah, somebody will. I feel like Steve Pete's probably the closest. That I can think of. And he's a legend, so. Yeah. He's a legend. Well, how about the next one? Store the bike with dropper post up or down. <laughs> this is definitive. Up. Well, yeah. Yeah. Up. Oh, unless Stop. you're my roommate, then it's down. <laughs> yeah. Well, the the reason is, is there's, it's, there's an air pressure chamber in there. So when it's up, there's less pressure going on, and therefore you've got less pressure on your seals and everything else, and it's just a better way to 
keep the post maintained for a long time. So, yep. yeah, L- leave that thing up. Same reason if you ever tied your motorcycle or your dirt bike down on the bed of a truck, you don't leave it like that overnight mm. with the suspension all compressed. Yep. It's not good. You don't, True. Want, you don't want that compression sitting there overnight. So I remember doing that. Always keep that dropper post up. But more importantly, don't yank on it to pull it up. Oh. With, you know what I mean? Oh. If it, your dropper post is in the dropped position. Yeah. Do not pull up on it. Yeah. Or yeah. like hang your bike from it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely yeah. not. Yeah. Those are your absolute worst case scenarios. Yep, absolutely. Worst case Ontario. Worst case Ooh. Ontario. How about this guy with his 2018 SB55? Read it, Jared. All right, I'll finish it. Well, uh, this listener is looking to get a shorter travel bike, like the Revel Ranger or the Yeti SB115 with a GX spec. But his 2018 Yeti SB55 has an X01 build. Would an average rider notice the difference between that SB55 with the high-end spec compared to the new bike with the GX build spec? Well, those are very, for starters, they're very different bikes. So 5.5 yeah, five is a 5.5-inch travel, which is like 6 inches travel in the front. It's like a full-blown, it's like an enduro yeah. bike. Yeah. yeah. Whereas he's talking about going to more of a light trail bike. Right. So it's totally different bikes. So. Because he lives in a flat area, and he thinks he has too much travel for... Yeah, area. well, that makes sense. So, a do lot you of think? he wouldn't be the first guy to have bought a bike with too much travel for his <laughs> requirements of trails needs That's around right. him. He wouldn't be. Um, I would say he would definitely notice a difference, but that's just like a really tough call um, on like if you were to swap him out because that's like such a different experience. X01 Yeti SB55 versus GX Ranger, like GX, yeah, I'd GX if, level suspension. I'd say if you try to just take the differences in the drive chain, the suspension. Yeah. You'll probably notice a bit of a difference. Even 2018 was still Eagle, still nice parts. Mm-hmm. Um, GX, you know, is still really good. I mean, half of our bikes have GX, like it still works really well. Um, yeah, the new GX, the new GX, which I yeah. guess, when did the, when did the new GX get released? Like a year or two ago. GX oh, Access, 2022 right? tooth cog, yeah. Not yeah. GS Access, well, but GX just like Access the like a year ago, GX. and then the re- revision like probably two years ago. Yeah, but that was a huge revision. Yeah, because yeah, current SRAM GX is really nice. Yeah, it's like solid. It's yeah, impressive stuff. Super solid. Um, I would I'd, say I'd yeah. say you would, but going from a five five to a shorter travel bike, you're already gonna feel kind of like Superman too. So like, mm-hmm. with, that's the bigger difference. Yeah, with your yeah your part spec difference you assume you're like man this bike feels way faster even though you know it might be you know heavier than the x01 spec or xx1 spec but yeah true um yeah. they're really good yeah like, like gx level suspension whether it's rock shocks or fox you get performance or select like it's really good i think i think the the gap that in 2018 there was a much bigger gap when you were looking at a bike that was a gx bike with you know gx price point suspension versus an xx1 yeah. or an x01 bike and the premium suspension there was a bigger gap there yeah there's less of a gap now i agree so nowadays 2020 2022 gx has come a long way shimano xt or even shimano slx and like the suspension it's there that gap's tightened up that yeah, so you're getting less of a huge jump in performance with going from something like SLX to XTR or GX to X01 mm-hmm. now than you did in 2018. Yep, I agree. So, yeah, because, I mean, I, I remember people used to be like, oh, I'm, you know, they would always want to spend the extra money for X01. Yep. And nowadays, people, everyone's totally satisfied with GX. They're like, stuff works great. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I have no problems with it. Yeah. <laughs> so... I feel like also the pricing has gone up on the X01 builds, and so it's less of an incentive. That's true too. Like the yeah. Yeti X01 build is like almost nine grand now, and it's like little, what happened? A little less digestible. That's called inflation, yeah. Jared. Yeah, inflation and yeah. Uh, yeah. just all <laughs> the of, supply chain so stuff. So one of our best viewed YouTube videos is the whole breakdown of SRAM drivetrains, basically going from NX all the way to X01, and talking about the kind of every little difference between all of them. And there's a whole graph in that video showing every individual component and their weight and price point, all that sort of stuff. So if you're curious on that. Definitely look into that. Um, 
but yeah, it's uh, I don't know. They've yeah, drive trains are. I don't know. It's one of those things too. Like if you read a lot of the comments on that video, some people are like, I, I this this is a great video. It totally helped me justify the you know getting GX. And then other people read it and they're like, oh, it's a great video. It totally helped me justify getting <laughs> XX1. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. there's no right answer I guess, here. I guess there's a perspective shift too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It it I thought it was hilarious reading the comments on that. But it's a popular video. We did it for Shimano drive trains as well. If you're curious to check those out. Yeah, those are good. Well, how about the next one? Moving on to suspension stuff. What mm. are the pros and cons of installing a Cascade link specifically to Yeti, but also in general? Do you think Cascade Components also makes fishing reels? Uh, <laughs> so I want to put this question in here because I don't – I mean, I, I think Cascade is doing some really cool stuff and just fine-tuning links to make bikes behave in a very certain way. But I don't – I don't know. I just – I have a hard time believing that that's really all that necessary for – 98% of people. Well, exactly. But some people would disagree with me. That's why they don't put them on from the factory. That's why they exist. It's because it's for those that niche of people that want yeah. that extra oomph or progressiveness, progressivity, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, they just want right? It makes it a little more progressive, a little, little more travel. Yeah, I mean, essentially it'll change your leverage rate most of the time. Cascade makes these links for bikes that could benefit from having a uh, higher leverage ratio. And most of the time it also slackens the head tube by roughly half a degree and lowers the bottom rack a little bit. So say you had a, you know, SB 150 and you want to put a cascade link on it. One, the bike will work better with a coil if you put it on slightly because it is uh, making a higher leverage ratio. Um, you also get a half degree slacker head tube if you want that and lower your bottom bracket a little bit. So, it's just just another adjustment for a bike that's made by a third party company instead of being like a bolt on from the factory. Yeah, I mean, there's some pretty fantastic engineers designing these bikes to begin with. So I don't know. I, yeah. I have a lot of trust in why they're designing things the way they are, and I think that for the vast majority of people that buy those bikes, they design them really well. At yeah. least nowadays. Yeah. Um, I agree. But, for sure. Yeah. And I think like, another fine tunement. Mountain yeah. bikers just love fine tunements, oh, don't yeah. they? Oh, yeah. Look, the, look at the Push 11.6. Plus, <laughs> plus it's Look a, at that rear shock. <laughs> look at it. The Cascade Link is a beautifully machined link yeah. that often comes does in a like, silver does. or mm. different color. Yeah, it definitely adds that extra um, je ne sais quoi to your yeah, bike. Yeah, exactly. Je ne sais quoi. Je and like Jared quoi. said, stock bikes are good for 95, 98% of people. So it's that 2 to 5% that yeah. really is like. Uh, you know, either you think it can be better and, you know, and you're just trying to have it mask your skills and or you actually know what it's going to do and it might make that bike just perfect for you. Yeah. Yeah, or you just like to experiment because it's that fun too. to just buy new things that at too. time. You see a shiny, cool part and you would think that would look really good on my mm -hmm. bike. Yeah, Jared, you love doing that. I love doing that. Yeah. <laughs> that is the one thing I haven't gotten is the Cascade Link and I would, uh. I would totally get it. I'm just, you know. Just that extra thing. It's yeah, I mean, like, I part, really of, need it. part of the mountain bike scene that is so cool and fun is how much customization there is. And yeah. You could just oh. change all these different things and you can make your, you know, 100 mil travel bike a burly version of it. And then you can change your suspension and wheels and make it a light version of it. And it totally. is really fun to do. And you can just do it based off of, you know, I don't know. It's like always just changing the flavor of that bike and how it works. And totally. That is really fun to do. So it's fun to tinker. It is fun to tinker. Yeah. But you love to tinker. I do. I've I've done some tinkering. <laughs> <laughs> I, I it's so weird because I used to do so much more tinkering, you know, pre pandemic because the just the parts supply was so much better. I was changing my bikes out every six months and just always upgrading to the latest and greatest. And something new would come out. I have to have that. And yeah. And now it's like oh something new came out finally. It's non stock for another three months. I'll oh, forget about it by then. <laughs> like I don't I don't know. I just I'm, I've been. Less I also that. think too that up I'd say probably a year before the pandemic was a good like jump in bike iteration to where you almost needed to tinker to get a bike to work exactly how you wanted it. Mm -hmm. And now these stock bikes kind of are like pretty dumb. They have the adjustment and they've caught on to the geometry trends and stuff. That's yep. we no longer have to cut Yeti seat tubes to get a, the bike Jeff wants, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Yeah, you don't need to use an angle set anymore to get the head tube angle. It just actually came right from them exactly. because the brand knows that that's a good one now. Yeah. yeah. And some some companies are doing really good, like, adjustable headsets, like, specialized on their Epic or their Stump Jumper Evos, I think. Mm -hmm. 
It's really good, like built in adjustable headsets. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Here's a nice simple question, but maybe not everyone knows the answer. Why are rotors a different size on my bike? My current setup is 203 front and 180 rear. Please help explain. Uh, mm. That's a pretty easy question. There's there's much more braking power. I think it's like, is it 70-30 that they say the split is? Yeah. I mean, it's just way more braking power comes from the front wheel than the rear wheel. This is the same thing in cars and I think any wheeled vehicle. It's just the physics of the machine. Mm-hmm. So you're always going to run. I wouldn't. I shouldn't say you're always going to, but uh, – because of that, you know, you, you need that larger rotor up front. And so a lot of brands will spec a bike with a larger front rotor and because you don't necessarily need that larger rotor in the back. Now, some people definitely yeah. – yeah. I, I have the argument of that. Of yeah, heat. That's like just been the trend. Um, but why, if you have 70% more braking power up front, do you want a bigger rotor to even extend that gap and make your rear brake feel less powerful – than if you were to maybe run a bigger rear rotor, which sometimes we're seeing in the downhill racing now. I think Joy Brosnan's running 220 rear, 200 front on his bikes. You sure about that? I'm pretty sure he's running a bigger rear rotor than the front. Yeah, rotor. a couple people are. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I wonder it, if they're, I because, wonder why though, if it's because, more related to heat. I don't know if it's heat, but I think they said it, it has a more even feel halfway down the track. Because your rear might fade a little bit and you're losing a little bit of power, which could be related to heat. Yeah, that a lot of it has to do with heat. Because so, a lot of people are dragging rear brakes too and they yeah. get way hotter and a bigger rotor is going to disperse that heat and exactly. work way better in that sense. So, I don't know. That That's just kind of how it always was traditionally done. I don't know if there's a huge scientific reason behind it. Yeah. Well, yeah, also if you look at a car, typically... You, like you said, Cars they have bigger like rotors that. in the front, yeah. or yeah. even like some even drum like, brakes in the yeah, back, drum in the, in the rear. front. Yeah, exactly. You so don't need that much power in the back to achieve what's necessary to get those wheels to slow down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is interesting, though. On a mountain bike, you can't always like guarantee you're going to have grip on the front, right? Like, yeah. case in point, my ankle is all jacked up, but. I mean, yeah. So you, you think could, that was because of the brakes? Are you blaming the brakes well, for your crash? <laughs> no. <laughs> did, did, did Adam? I'm have blaming two, the lack of traction. Adam have too small of a rotor, and because of that, <laughs> you didn't brake enough. I think they corner. were actually too powerful. That's my complaint. Yeah. Too powerful. <laughs> <laughs> what brakes were on that bike? Or TRP uh, DHR Evo. Oh, like yeah. Another like Those the brake I've powerful. never run before. But whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Look at how bitter this guy is. Well, yeah! but, but whatever. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Um, I see the argument for both bigger rotor in the front and bigger rotor in the rear. And I've seen racers running bigger rotors in the rear. So, yeah, but that's very rare. Yeah, racers also do weird things. So, I'll tell you what you guys saw. <laughs> yeah, because they're riding their bikes at a speed none of us are, which is one thing to take into consideration. But the other thing to take into consideration is that they're racers, so they're very, very in their head yeah. and doing things like wearing unmatching socks because one time they won some race with unmatching socks. <laughs> and the next 15 years they wore unmatching socks thinking it was going to work again. So there's there's a lot of stuff like that going on in the racing scene and any competitive sports. So That's amazing. Be, be cautious of that superstition. That's true. All right, That's Jared, true. read the next All one. All right, well – Love your show. My question is, we know how important a professional bike fit is for a road bike, but how important is a pro fit for a mountain bike? Excellent question. Yeah, it's interesting because being professionally fit in the road scene is super important and huge yeah. and everyone kind of does it, but it's it's certainly not uh, really a thing at all in the mountain bike scene. Especially anything away from XC riding. Yeah. Like once you get away from an XC bike, it's pretty much non-existent. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I mean, I I think, uh, Liam, I'm sure you'd have a good perspective on this since you've spent more time riding road bikes than Jared or I have and fit people on road bikes. But to me, it's, you know, mountain bike fitment, it's it's different because you're in and out of the saddle yeah, so much more. it's much more dynamic. You're not, yeah, it's much more dynamic. It's much more preference. Yeah. So like, you're really like, oh, I actually prefer the bars higher up because it helps me pull the front wheel off the ground when I want a bunny hop or manual, which is like not <laughs> what road bikers are saying. Totally different thing. You're riding a bike for less time most of the time. Like yep. the average mountain biker goes out for an hour or two hour ride. Road cyclists are on that in that saddle in the same position, sitting down yeah. for yeah. five hours. I think you know yeah. it's just it's just a totally different sport. The way you're on the bike and how you move, and so it's it's just that whole fitment concept is is very yeah. It's just it's just yeah. very different for mountain biking. Yeah, I think that's pretty much exactly it. Your mountain bike is more dynamic, right? You're moving around more, even just climbing. Yeah, you might be on an hour climb, but like 
you're not on a perfect gradient for an hour climb that's smooth most of the time. You're going over rough terrain. You're, you know, balancing your bike up and over rocks. Um, and then how much of your mountain bike are you actually out of the saddle going downhill? That has nothing to do with fit. Yeah. So I think it's probably important to get your right saddle height. And if you're more towards, like, the pedaling side of things, saddle height fore and aft of your saddle – um, on your post, and then maybe cleat placement uh, yeah, matters. Like the, the more you're sitting down pedaling and the longer you're doing that, the more important it is yeah. to have your fitment really dialed in. But if you're worried about going downhill, then you just want your cleats kind of pushed back anyways. Or if you're really worrying about doing sick whips. Sick whips. <laughs> you know, well, then scrubbing you don't jumps. Even, you don't even really want to be in if you want to do sick whips. <laughs> oh, people can do sick whips clipped in. Oh, I'm saying they can, but like, <laughs> You can do sicker ones, not clipped in. Uh, I feel like a lot of people also, they just like, if they're buying a mountain bike, they just get on it and they're like, this either feels good or it doesn't. Like I either need a bigger size or smaller size or a shorter stem or not. You yeah. know, it's yeah. like, and then they like, just change that based on their preference. Yeah. Pretty like, standard. Obviously you need your saddle height correct. Like, yeah. That's, oh, that's of course. obviously yeah. saddle like, height, of course. you need saddle height correct. Yeah. But. but I think for a mountain bike, it's more important to dial in your suspension and tire pressure. And that'll make a much bigger difference for your mountain bike ride. Yeah, totally. totally. And and figuring out your preferences, realizing if you like high-rise bars. I mean, high-rise bars, that was a trend a while ago that, I mean, still on trend to some extent, but a lot of people realize, oh, I actually really enjoy high-rise bars on my mountain bikes. We made a whole YouTube video about it, did super well. People were really interested in that topic because high-rise mountain bike bars definitely change the way a bike feels and handles, and it might change it the way it feels and handles in a way that you just absolutely love. So, yeah, something to consider there, which, yeah. again, has something entirely to do with ride and handling preference and not to do with, quote-unquote, fit. Yep. I want to get some high-rise drop bars. Specialized man for a while. Go find them. Do they seriously? Just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> some type of riser Was it an April thing. Fool's joke? <laughs> no, it was some oh, gravel. Oh, that would have been awesome. April Fool's gravel joke. thing. <laughs> Trail one high-rise drop bar. <laughs> <laughs> And oh, it's just man. literally a drop bar that puts your your <laughs> your bar height at the exact same height of flat bar wood. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That would be good. Oh man! All right, here's a question from Josh Saunders. Saunders. He Josh was on Saunders. our. Uh, we we did a collaboration trip with Chasing Epic Mountain Bike Tours, and he was on Crested Butte, right? That's yeah. right. Yeah, uh, he was a rad dude. His question is: Bald, rich, or fat? Must choose two of three. Mm. Mm. I'll go first because I already know. Um, I'm working on the first – actually, I'm working on both of them, bald and rich. <laughs> uh, I thought Jeff, Jeff had a different comment earlier. Right. Well, we were thinking – we were like, well, this this is lame. We're all, we're all just going to say you want to be bald and rich. But then I thought, whoa, 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 slow down. Why not be rich and fat because then you can just – you know, ride your bike more, and then all of a sudden you're rich and fit and have and, hair. Yeah. And or you're rich. And you have hair. So you can just Double like win. do it. Yeah. you know, rich people do and get surgery. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff could have been all of, that. Jeff's all of these actually, but he just grew his hair back and he lost the weight. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> oh. uh, that's, that's a that's a tricky question. Yeah, well, it you kinda, it. I mean, it kind of reminds me of that, uh, which is more of a mountain bike related thing. I think it was it was Keith Bontrager. The quote it was it was light, yeah, light, cheap, and strong. Pick two. He pretty much. Yeah. Ooh. maybe isn't that cool? Words, but yeah, yeah. I like that. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. All that's right, cool. Liam, what are you going with? Oh, I mean, I'm working on going bald, um, <laughs> and I'd love to be rich. So. <laughs> uh, there you yeah. go. Jeff Bezos, here we come. Jeff I don't Bezos. know. I, I, my body type, I don't know if I could ever get fat. So It would have know. to be pretty, yeah. I mean, you'd have to work There's at it. There's a lot of follow-up questions. It's like how fat? It's like 700 pounds. Like that's a serious issue. Yeah. yeah. Or is it like, you know, you're the 50 pounds says, overweight. Doctor says knock that off in a couple months. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're, we're overthinking it. All right. It's not supposed to be a serious question. In the weeds. <laughs> How much water do you bring on rides? Uh, that that question, I don't know. I, I feel like that's, that's, that's a fairly novice question, but the answer is – you know, just consider how long you're riding and how hot it is outside and how much exertion level you're going to be putting out. And then uh, maybe it's not that much of a novice question. Well, yeah, it also depends if you can refill. Like, I only bring yeah, a true. water bottle with me to Sycamore these days because I can refill. But yeah. if I'm going to, like, I don't know, any yeah. other zone where Almost you can't. all the time, if I'm just going to do a one-hour ride, which is kind of the norm for me, I'll just bring one water bottle. Yeah. Yeah, I actually plan roughly one water bottle per hour i'm going to be riding that's a maybe good push an hour and a half if it's not 90 degrees and dry yeah 
Yeah. yeah. But then you got to factor in too if there's water bottle refill stations or if there's well, creeks and then you can bring a, a filter with exactly. you. Exactly. So yeah. that's why you have to factor in. But I try to plan for one hour per – one bottle per hour. Yep. So if I know I'm doing a five-hour ride with zero water out there, I'll put two on my bike and the rest on my back. Yep. Which I did the other week, and it wasn't fun to start with that much water. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like most, you know, hour-long, two-hour rides are fairly easy to figure that one out. It gets way more complicated if you're doing these big adventure rides um, and you're just you're going to be in the bike on the bike for more than a couple hours and it gets more complicated and you got to figure out, is there water out there? Can I refill? Mm-hmm. Um, there's those things called bee-free water bottles or yep. the filters. Those are my absolute favorite ones. I take those with me all the time on huge adventures and backpacking trips and hiking and big, long rides. Um, really simple. You can fill them up in a creek and it just has that, you know, filter um, but yeah, that's a, that's a must. I always yeah. take that with me on, on that, long adventures. That Colorado trip, some guys were only using one water bottle for three hour rides because there's creeks everywhere. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You just fill them up. Yeah, and you just bring it. that. It's like, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a way better way to do it, in my opinion. And it's nice if you're going on a big ride to just have one of those filters with you because yeah. it's just safer. Totally, bro. Totally, bro. For real, how do you make the frames float? Ooh, asking the tough questions. The, so that question for context, we have posted a lot of really cool photos of mountain bike frames floating. And then we made a, a real Instagram little video about how we do that. And Jared was the host and we showed we that that's that's been a, the most controversial yeah. piece of content we put out in a long time because sure. people thought the whole thing was serious and they really got pissed <laughs> yeah. off. I shouldn't say everyone. A lot of people thought it was absolutely hilarious and yeah. there was just like tons of LOLs. But there was a ton of people like, are you kidding me? You just ruined the frame. So in the, in the video, which was a spoof, just for the yeah. record, we actually <laughs> asked Revel, hey, do you guys have a – it was like a throwaway frame, like yeah. something that was a, a defect or a manufacturing issue or warranty, whatever, that looks relatively new – so what we're going to do is, you know, basically make this video saying, hey, everyone asks how we take these photos of these floating frames. And then, you know, we, we set up the whole scene. We've got the photographer, the camera, tripod, and then we just like threw the frame and just dropped it on the concrete. And then, and then <laughs> stood up. I was like, ah, oh, it wasn't in the air long enough. And then so someone goes on top of some like dumpster thing and throws it off higher and then eventually throws it off a roof. And it's just like basically destroying the frame for the sake of a photo. Um which was hilarious, and uh, that was obviously a throwaway frame. But people got um, very, uh, very upset about that. So they did, but it was, it was uh, not a rideable frame. Yeah, so everybody knows wasn't usable. we yeah. didn't just chuck a perfectly good um, rail off the roof. But I mean, as far as making them fro- float, that's how we do it. So <laughs> <laughs> moving on. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, it's photography wizardry. Yes. So and none of us are really actually the photographers that know how to do that. But the rough actual answer is you take a photo of a scene and then someone walks in with a frame with the seat post in the frame and then kind of holds the frame in place. They take a photo of that. And they combine the two photos and then put in some fake shadowing. Do I have that relatively right, Louis? Yeah. Nailed it. There it is. Nailed it. So Nailed boom. It. That's it. That's all. But if you want some good humor, go to our YouTube channel, look at the shorts, look at that one. I think it's like almost a million views. Yeah. And the comments are out of this world. Some, yeah. pe- <laughs> some people are livid. Other people are l- making fun of people who thought it was serious. And there's people oh, who man. was laughing and like, why are you laughing? There's ruining frames. I mean, it's like, it's ridiculous. You can hang out in that comment section. You can hang out in that oh, comment yeah. section. There's a lot of comments on that. Just YouTube bring your popcorn. Show. I'm just, yeah, com- I'm just so here good. for the comments, baby. Yeah, they're yeah, so it, funny. It totally is. Try and put fires out like, God, it's not real. I know. <laughs> well, yeah, we did have to put a pinned comment at the top that said, yeah. hey, this was a joke. This is, was a warranty, yeah. blah, 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 because people were just freaking out. Yeah, even people yeah. at Revel didn't know, apparently. Oh, yeah, yeah that's right. right. We went out there yeah, and like, yeah. we can't believe you guys threw it back up. Like, we didn't yeah, actually yeah, know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't think, I don't think Adam informed all the employees. Yeah. yeah. I think he just grabbed one from the back that. and said, yeah, this is trash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah. Oh, good stuff. Yeah. Good fun content. I like doing things like that. That's what's great about being the mountain bike industry. You can do fun things like that. Totally. That was a good time. It's all good. We can make jokes because we're in this industry. Yeah. So it's fun. Absolutely. Well, that's it. That's all. Jared has to go to dinner. He's got a hot date. That's right. Is that right? Where are you going? I'm going to Trenchill Hill Brewing Company here Uh, in town. I was... Very nice. It's nine out of ten, gonna say <laughs> Italian food. <Yeah. laughs> and I'm getting spaghetti and meatballs. I'm just kidding. I'm getting meatballs. Oh, man. Well, if you've made it this far in the listening, thank you very much. We love you. We appreciate it. And we will talk to you guys in the next episode. Sure will. Over and out. Cheerio, mates. Carry out, mates. <laughs>